Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I, as, as he mentioned, I'm the VP of product at Triple Byte. So what we do, Triple Byte, our mission is to build an open and valuable and skills-based credential for all engineers across the world and find them great jobs at awesome companies. Um, so we technically screen engineers ourselves. Um, it's all background blind, and we do that and give companies the tools to find and hire really quickly these awesome engineers. So that's what we do. Um, but what, what we're really successful is when our companies actually have um, not just great candidates, but great employees. And part of that is great engineers are you know, good at aligning with product teams. So this, this I think, topic is really important to us as a business. Um, but it's also important to me. So I think a quick kind of personal anecdote. Um, so I've been at Triple Byte for about two years. Uh, and when I started on you know, my first day, I came in, I was ready to start PMing everything, right? You know, do the sprints and, and, and write the specs and all that. Um, and then I like kind of looked around and realized nobody here has ever worked with a product manager before. So it kind of like started realizing that. And then later that day, I had coffee with a senior engineer. Um, and he, you know, we sit down, he looks at me like, Aaron, you seem like a good guy, but why are you here? <laughs> and so, you know, it was kind of a wake up call of realizing that like, it's not obvious how we all work together and there's no exact playbook for this. Um, and it kind of was my realization that this is a really important topic. Um, so with that, I wanted to quickly ask the room, raise your hand since, so the, the analog version of, of polling, raise your hand if you feel like you have perfect alignment between engineer, engineering and product. Oh, yep, yeah, all right. I was about to say, if you raise your hand, you're probably lying to yourself. So, um, but obviously most of you didn't raise your hand, so I think we have our work cut out for us. So with that, I wanted to give a round of applause for our panelists to come on up. Awesome. We're supposed to sit under our faces. So that's why we're all looking back here. Um, OK, so just a, as a quick introduction, um, I'll go far side to closer. So Rishali um, is, a, is a VP of engineering at Salesforce, um, and where she leads the Salesforce communities, which is one of the fastest growing products at Salesforce. Um, and prior to Salesforce, Rishali was a software development engineer at Amazon and holds a master's degree from, from Wharton. Um, and Danny uh, is um, the VP of Engineering at LogDNA, one of our sponsors. Uh, um, and and he's, the, um, he's an experienced software engineer who's worked at Facebook and Yahoo, has a master's degree in CS from Stanford. Um, and then finally, Selena is, Instacart's, uh, is a senior product manager at Instacart. And she previously worked as a product manager at Facebook, where she has experience in both consumer and monetization ad products. So, all those intros, so another round of applause. Thank you for joining us. Awesome, so I kind of wanted to kick it off with a bit of a broader question of kind of like a why we're here question. So, you know, why does this relationship between product and engineering not always work? You know, what, what's the impact of this? Why does this matter? Um, so you want to start with, with you? Sure. Yeah, I think when you have really ambitious, smart people working together constantly, there's always going to be some natural tension that comes out of it. Um, and then I think some of it's going to be because of organizational reasons. Some of them it could be more personal reasons. But I think in general, it's really important to really nail this relationship because when it doesn't work out, you, the product ends up hitting a stalemate where nothing actually moves forward. Or I think in worst case, the team morale goes down. Um, so I think there's a lot of consequences that come out of it. Um, but there's definitely solutions that we'll dive into next. Yes. Um, I think a source of a lot of the tension is really where this, um, the source of the attention is. I think product tends to be more externally focused, right? You're gathering requirements, trying to figure out what customers need, what partners need. Whereas engineering tends to be more internally focused, like what does it take to implement things? Um, what does it take to get things done? There's a tension with that, right? Because externally you just want to deliver as much as you can. Internally you want to implement um, in a solid way. And I think also attention comes because um, the two sides generally don't see the other side. Engineering doesn't know about external requirements. A product doesn't fully understand what it takes to get stuff done. So I think that just causes tension yeah. at times. Yeah. And then to just build on that, I think most of the times when I've seen the relationship not work is because there's a lack of trust, uh, a lack of trust from the EM side, a lack of trust from the PM side. 
and there's a lack of communication and and an include lack of being included when decisions are being made, whether they're decisions on the engineering side or decisions about what product is being built. And so all that kind of builds up and sort of leads to, to more tension. Are the, are the, do, you, do any of you have any examples of this going like horribly wrong? So I have seen, yeah. <laughs> I have seen that in my career. Um, we basically had a team where there was a complete breakdown for a while. The team had not been delivering any products, and they, we had like um, an us versus them kind of a situation. And every time a deadline was missed, then fingers were being pointed, and so it was pretty abys a dismal situation because um, they were they stopped being functional as a unit. And when that happens, you know you have to basically do some kind of reorg, you have to move out some people, and you know, it's really hard to get out of the situations when, once you're there. So yeah, I've unfortunately seen. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely has a, a very high impact. So um, I wanted to kind of get into a little bit actually the role of product. So the role of engineers in kind of its most generic sense is, is probably more obvious than the role of product. The role of product is often like changes a lot between organizations and is not always well-defined. Um, so how do you edu go about educating your organizations of the role of product? You know, what, what barriers do you find or what do you do to, to do that? So I, I wanted to start maybe Danny with you. Sure, I agree with you that it's big. I think every startup has, well, a tech startup has an engineer. Uh, they don't always have a product person, so people don't always see the need. Um, I'm an engineer, but one thing that um, our head of product has done well at my company, LogDNA, is they're constantly educating the company literally about what product management is. He has this presentation, what is product management, and he gives it frequently. So it's not just a message that's said once, it's something that's kind of reinforced, because for a lot of junior engineers or people at startups, um, they don't always know. So I think just reinforcing what that is, and, and since that role varies at different companies, uh, reinforcing what that means for us uh, in our context has been super helpful. Yeah, and what about you, Selena, as our you know, uh, one product person as a panelist. Yeah, I mean, I think it's once you've established the roles and responsibilities, it's really reinstating that even during onboarding. And so that's something that we've done in the past where it doesn't matter if it's research, design, and PM, but for each onboarding session, whether it's, let's say if your onboarding engineering is educating them on how to work with researchers or designers or PM, how do you work with eng or how do you work with other functions, is kind of um, really defining that and then and reinstating that very, very early on so they understand the culture and they understand the flow of things before they even start working. Interesting. So is it, is it part of onboarding is the time yeah. you do this? Yeah. Do, do you, have you guys found barriers to this or just like pushback or like, you know, for example, you know, new companies, engineers wanting, you know, not agreeing with that role. Have you seen that or is it, is it normally pretty straightforward? Well, I will say there's a reason why our head of product reinforces that message. It's not that there's pushback. It's just that it's either ignorance or forgetting sometimes. And, you know, we're hiring aggressively, so new engineers still always know. So they fall back to either what they've seen elsewhere or just not having any knowledge whatsoever. So um, it's not that people are pushing back, but it's still a message that needs to be reinforced. And I think yeah. the more you do it, the, the better it is. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, so, so kind of switching gears to... You know, not so much the roles, but actually like the hiring process. So this is obviously, you know, one way you can create a better culture around these two teams or around, you know, building more alignment is just to hire people who kind of fit with this, you know, the vision for, for these two teams. So, um, you know, at Triple Byte, we have PMs interview engineers and engineers interview PMs. So I'm curious, and, and Rishali, I'll start with you. Um, as you're building teams, kind of what are you looking for in, you know, engineers that you're hiring to kind of create more alignment and create more collaboration between these teams? Yeah, so I think we look for a few things. One is um, we want to see a track record of the engineers having delivered products consistently. We also want to see examples from their past career about where they've collaborated and communicated and you know where they've been in situations where they had to work with other teams, they had to work with other cross-functional peers, and they succeeded in that role. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, we also ask them questions about what is the perspective on the products that they built. Like, what were mm -hmm. their product insights and what did they think about it? Because it's important as an engineer might to even have opinions on that uh, and understand that. Um, and then lastly, prioritization. Like, how do they prioritize once they have a set of things that they want to build on? Uh, and so we look, we, uh, we ask questions around that and see how... Interesting, yeah. It, building on that, one thing that we we found effective is actually asking, you know, so we'll, uh, you guys may do this too, but when we're interviewing engineers, we'll actually ask like, what feedback do you have about our product, mm -hmm. right? They're actually users yeah. of our product, but even if they weren't, you know, what kind of 
give us your product yeah. intuition about it. What's wrong with it? Um, and then they'll normally point something out. And then I always like to say, like, so what's the trade-off? Like, why didn't we build right. it that way? And right. so I think that getting to like some product or user empathy. Um, again, I'm talking from as a product person interviewing engineers. Um, getting some of the product or user empathy is a good sign that like that will work well when the product manager and engineer are you know disagreeing on something. Yeah. Um, so so then what about um, what about hiring? So think about engineering managers. I think many people here are engineering managers. So that's a really kind of critical role. It's like this node in the organization of like you know. Engineering managers are working with all the engineers, but they're also the kind of teammate and point of contact with the PM, and so kind of really critical in this. So, how do you think about hiring as you get big enough, hiring that kind of role? Um, and I put it back to you again, Rochelle. Just especially since Salesforce is really big, and right, yeah. you've done this yeah. a lot. Um, I think it, it again comes back to so you know they of course have to be technically strong, but it does come back to them being able to collaborate and work with other people and work in, in an environment where they may not have full control, but they are still able to get things done. They're able to influence their way through things. And so we are looking for examples of that. Uh, and other than that, you know, having a perspective on the product that they're building. So it remains the same even if you're looking for engineering managers at a higher level. Do, do you have much. product teams interview them? I mean, are you, are you how yeah. heavily is the, is the interview panel kind of made up of product versus engineering? It, it's a mix. So we do have PMs actually interview engineering, and I feel that's a very important part of the process because PMs have their set of questions that, through which they figure out if, that would, if the engineering person would be a good counterpart to work with. So that's important too. Yeah. Danny, I, do you want to fill in on this too? I mean, just to be totally honest, I find this really difficult. Like that engineering manager, product manager relationship is really key, but it's also a really hard thing, personally, I find really hard to evaluate for an engineering managers for various reasons. One, as an engineer myself, it's easy for me to evaluate them on the dimensions I care about. And because of the role of the PM changes in different contexts, it's also hard to figure out if you know they're used to one context and whether they work in the particular context of my company. So um, I actually prefer to promote within because of that. Um, it's not the only thing you have to be able to hire externally, but when you promote from within, you know that they can who can succeed within the culture that you have there. They, you know what the role of product is and whether they interact well with that. So you're, I know you're asking the question, how do you hire on these qualities, but I actually find it easier um, to hire, uh, to promote from within for this reason. Um, kind of a dodge, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, so I, I actually, I'll, I'll dig into that. So what are signs that your team members are kind of in, in like, you know, in a position to step up into that role, mm -hmm. whether it's a tech lead or at EM or like, you know, how do you, how do you f identify that? Opportunity. Well, at our company, and I'm sure at most companies, you know, the PM isn't solely interacting with just the EM. Right. Um, so the engineers are interacting with products. So you actually get a model to see how they're um, dealing with product already, whether they have a product-focused mind, whether they're willing to, you know, take external considerations, um, and just you know how they interact with our, each other personally. So just that model is already happening. So it's just kind of furthering that. Yeah. Do, do you wind up like setting up kind of? Uh, uh, situations for them to kind of excel with product managers? Are you kind of looking at that in that way, or are you just like in the background? Kind well, of you know, seeing? we're a startup around 70 people, and so our PMs, we're at the stage where the PMs have to be pretty in the weeds. So they're all pretty much interacting with um, individual managers all the time because the projects are small, and so they just have to. So it does, actually doesn't take work on my part to make that happen, just had a necessity it has to, but um, that's kind of how things have been for yeah. us. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I actually wanted to, so we've already now talked, it's very hard to avoid the topic of culture, which I think we've already kind of brought up in a, in a number of pieces here. Um, but I wanted to kind of dig into that. So we've talked, I've already heard a few times, the natural tension, right? So there is a natural tension between engineering and product and EMs and PMs um, in the day to day. So how do you create a culture that works on that? Like, it, you know, maybe, maybe it's not a problem. So I think it's, you know, Maybe it isn't something to solve, but how do you kind of create the right atmosphere? Um, what's the secret recipe to, to that culture thing? Um, so I want to just start with you, Selena. Yeah, I think for tension, there's probably two broad categories. There's one where it's just personal tension, and that could just be making sure that you have empathy for each other, bringing each other along the journey, having good communication and expectations. I think the second one is probably going to be more stemmed on the organizational structure. Um, and what I mean by that is, especially when you have conflicting goals or basically what makes each side successful is different. So an example could be if on product, they're gold on growth and on edge, they're gold on, let's say, quality. Um, 
I think in some in some situations they actually come in conflict with each other, and so it becomes really hard to align what it is that you're trying to do because one might directly conflict with the other. So I think a lot of it is making sure that you have one goal, one shared goal, so that everyone's incentivized to aim for the same thing. So it's not a question of what it is we're trying to achieve, but rather what is the best way of doing that. And so the conversations you have are much healthier. Um, and in that case, some of the conflict actually might be good because it's just like healthy discussion and conversation. Yeah, do you have examples of having used that before, been a part of that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think like, just like the example I gave a lot of times for product, um, if, like, quality isn't as big of uh, a focus area, it's actually instating product to be, to, to be accountable for that, too. So it's like the goal could be we have, um, let's say, like, growth of 10%. Increase of let's say it's like DAP, but then you have like zero. You might have tiers of issues, so it's like you have zero of these. Um, we call them unbreak nows, but like zero issues that happen, um, and like both sides are accountable for for both of those metrics. Interesting. So I guess I'll throw this back over to the engineers on on the panel. So how do you? Um, so I guess it's kind of the same question. So how do you? Kind of, what's the secret recipe here? But I'm curious. You know, in the aligning goals, how? How do you, you know, how do you both grow and also ship great code? Well, I'll take a stab at this, but um, I, I like that answer a lot. I think aligning the goals is really important. And like, in, I'll give a flip example. Like, I have seen places where engineers are assessed off like how many lines of code they write, or you know, how many bugs did they fix. It's purely operational, right? And it has nothing to do with the product itself. So, you know, making their goals the same as the product's goals, you know, shipping a product in a certain way in a timely fashion, um, that type of line is really important. I just want to echo what Selena's saying. I think that's really important. And it may sound obvious, but I have seen engineering orgs where you know that doesn't happen. You know, if you just create on lines of code, then it has nothing to do with alignment. So. So, so, but what about quality, right? So, so lines of code, right, like I think it makes sense, right? Like if, yeah. if you can write it in fewer, that's maybe good. Yeah. Right? So, but then what about quality of the code? Well, one thing we uh, mean for an org where is basically one third of the engineering uh, goals, each engineer's goal should be product focused, and then the other two thirds mm. are engineering focused. That's kind of the ratio we look for um, in their regular reviews. Um, and those two thirds tend to be around things like stability, reliability, quality, things like that. Um, that's how we do it. Um, it's so, a model. So just to dig into that, I think it's really an, an interesting, maybe different model than other folks. What, what does it mean to have like thirds of goals mm -hmm. for every engineer? I mean, just to be super specific, <laughs> if you have three goals for the next half year, one of them will be the product you're going to ship, and then two of them will be around stuff like you know, code quality, right, okay. stability, maybe even mentoring and different things like that, um, non-product focused things. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. It, one thing we do is that um, when we have our monthly reviews where the team is presenting what they've been working on for the previous month, one slide is around the features that they built. And then the next two slides are actually around quality, like how many customer cases came in, how many investigations, how many bugs. And so, you know, that emphasis is always there. And the PM and the EM are standing together and giving that presentation. So it's very, it's very clear to the PM organization as well that quality is important. It's one of the things we look at, not just the features that are shipped. Interesting. So you actually are saying the, the PM and EM are standing together giving a presentation, and that involves both the quality metrics or stability or, or kind of the engineering yes. side metrics yes. and the product metrics. Yes. Interesting. How, and does that, how, does that co ownership wind up working really well, or does it ever create conflict? I think of, in some ways it forces them to find the middle ground where yeah. they can balance the, the trust or, uh, on the team and then also all the technical debt and balance it with the features that they need to build and then get feedback on that. And you know, sometimes teams are leaning one way or the other, they get the feedback that, hey, you know, maybe you're doing too much, maybe you need to focus a little more on quality. But they're in it together when they're making that presentation, so. I like that. So just <laughs> the united front is probably yeah. a good way to force them to get on the same page. Um, so, so kind of, I think another element of culture or a huge element of culture is structure, right? So how do you actually distribute a team? How do you create little sub teams and, and combine them with product and design and all that. So I, Danny, I want to start with you on this one, um, just from your experience um, in several of the big companies you've worked for before. Um, so so it, you know, there are a lot of product-driven organizations and um, where engineers maybe don't feel as empowered. And then there's a lot of engineering-driven organizations where PMs don't feel empowered. And so can you have the best of both? Or like, how do you structure things to provide empowerment? 
Um, yeah, so if I could share a bit about my background, because yeah. it informs a lot of how I feel about this. So I was at Yahoo between 2004 and 2007, that's a while ago. Um, Yahoo was still a great company at the time, but it's definitely kind of on, on its way down. From there, I went to Facebook from 2000 to 2015. Um, so early Facebook, there were like 300 people at the company when I joined it. But bigger, more than trajectory up and down was like the strong contrast in what product was. So at Yahoo, they had a very, almost a GM model of product managers. So they just kind of make decisions, they just say everything and engineers just implement it. Um, Facebook was almost the extreme opposite where engineers, they just had this um, culture of engineers owning everything so much that um, PS basically had no say. Like, it, it's really hard for them. Engineers had the final say in everything, even down to an individual level. So it was really an extreme contrast in what uh, the PM does. Um, I actually think both of them were unhealthy. I think these are as extreme as you can get. I think in the Yahoo model, engineers ended up feeling no ownership at all. Um, in retrospect, I think we all felt like code monkeys. You just tell us what to do and we'll do it. And very little creativity or ownership. And that's not healthy, I think. Um, Honestly, I think that's one of the reasons why Yahoo kind of uh, failed. Uh, maybe that's saying it too strongly, but there was not a sense of engineering excitement and ownership, and that's not healthy. On the flip side, at Facebook, PM, I, I feel like PMs had the hardest job in the world. They had a job to do and zero authority to make it happen. You couldn't make any, any engineer do anything. And so I, I don't, it was, it was crazy. Um, I don't think that's healthy either because um, it was a little chaotic and, and you know, if everyone's doing what they want to do and there's no coordination, then um, you just luck out into things happening um, the way you do. So I do think you have to land somewhere in the middle. Um, and I think the ideal has to be somewhere in the middle, but I, I'm not always sure what that is. Um, I'm kind of going back to what Selena said before, just about alignment. Um, I think that's really important, just collaborating from the very beginning. I think that's the real key. Um, at Yahoo, because stuff happened up front from PMs first, engineers really got to say in how things go until the work reached them, and that's not good. And, and at Facebook, you know, PMs couldn't really say much. So just collaboration, whatever your process is from the beginning, engineers and product up front, I think is the most important thing. Is that ever like, you know, hierarchy, you know, one group kind of making decisions, the other group just executing, is at least simpler, right? I mean, there is a clear line of somebody chooses and somebody executes. So like, you know, collaboration obviously is a, I think, what we're talking about and I think is a, is a good in this case, but I imagine it comes at a cost, right? Like, I, I mean, have you, that middle ground, I mean, have you found that to be somewhat costly? Like, is it harder to keep these people aligned and harder to share a goal versus one person have it and make decisions? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think there is a short-term cost with a long-term benefit. The short-term cost is that um, when you have a dictator, you can get stuff done quickly, right? Yeah. But when you have the chaos of collaboration and of consensus, even though it slows things down in, in the short term, when people feel ownership and excitement about it, it makes them execute much faster in the long term. And I, I think that's what happened at Facebook in the early days. Yeah, I, I would join, it's like, what the heck is going on? It's just chaos, but somehow people felt empowered and we just executed really quickly when you looked back. So it's a great question though. Yeah. Um, Selena, I'm curious, just like you've been at Facebook more recently um, and, now, and now at Instacart. So I'm curious, like how have you seen these cultures either, did it stay kind of the way he described it or has it like evolved and how does that compare with where you are now? Yeah. Fortunate for me, it's gotten a little bit better by the time I got there. Um, but I will say that I think the, the there's, I think there's two bars. There's like, when is an organizational side where just from top down, the culture is a lot harder to change like for one person. Um, but I think there's like, it, there's like some things you can do to just take one step at a time. And that's just like asking for a seat at the table. So it's when, whether you're engineer or PM, if there's like meetings that's happening that you're not part of, but you think would be important for you to be part of, it's just like asking to be part of it and saying like, hey, can I just absor observe? Can I be a, a fly in the room? And I think the biggest thing is just like having context because um, I think to Danny's point, it's, um, in the end, it's like there's a short term cost to it, but in the long term, the product, the quality, the solution you're going to have is so much better because everyone who has different assets, who has, diff has something different to bring to the table, has full context. And I think that's the most important thing. Like when you just hand something from like one, like from product to design to then edge, then there isn't context the entire way through. And then a lot of information just gets dropped off along the way. Um, and so just like your original vision is going to get slowly discounted by the time you get to the end. Whereas everybody, if everybody has that full context, you can, as you go down the path, everyone will just add more to it. And so at the end, it's going to look better than what it started off as. Yeah, no, I think it's actually a great point, which is, you know, it's a, what do you do when you're in the situation that we're talking about, but like the culture isn't the right way, right? You know, some of us are in positions to absolutely change that culture or affect it or 
you know, dictated or whatever. Um, but some of us aren't. And so then what do you do about it? And I like that asking for the seat. I mean, if like, just from my own experience, if engineers, you know, work on a project and somebody says, hey, you know, I'd like to be in that planning meeting, actually. Like, I have some great ideas. Like, be like awesome. You know, like, I, that would actually be a, a huge positive. Um, but like, that's, I think that's, that's a great point that like, regardless of the culture, asking for a seat at the table is a way to, to get there. Yeah. Actually. So in the midst of chaos or unclear lines of communication, I, the quality, I think the best PMs I've worked with is almost like a Jedi mind trick. They're so good at communication. They can convince people to do stuff um, without them realizing that they're being convinced to do something, you know what I mean? <laughs> so they will do it and they think it's their own idea, but really it's like the Jedi mind thing that's been planted in them because they communicate so well and they explain the rationale so well. Um, I, and this is actually a trick, a generally useful trick in life, right? Like I think parenting actually involves it to some point. You want to get your kids to do it. You don't tell them to do it. You convince them it's their idea to do it. Anyway, so, um, but yeah. that is what I've observed. PMs that communicate so well that engineer, other people think, not think it's their own, they're so convinced that they just do it. So can you break down how to do a Jedi mind trick? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> There's a reason why I'm uh, engineering and not PMs. <laughs> No, I mean, they're the only, so I'm not sure how to do that Jedi mind trick, but I, the, the, the thing I like definitely am hearing is like, it's so obvious that this is the thing to do because the rationale is so clear and like it's communicated so well and at the right times to the right people that are just like so obvious it's, it has to be done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's part of it. I don't know. I, I, well, yeah, I mean, how it's communicated too, right? Because sometimes if you've gone through the process as PM and you've arrived at the conclusion, oh, it's so obvious we should do this without explaining how you got there, just the explanation can be what makes it compelling and the lack of it can make it really uh, right. resistant. Yeah. Right. And that's a, a kind of a principle I, I um, like to impart on, on the PMs of my team, which is that you should at any point in time on any feature or product that you're working on, you should be able to spit out like a great two sentence rationale. And if you can't, then you need to go do research or figure out why we're not doing something else. Right. And like, I think that that hopefully helps with that where you're like, there's always a very clear answer. Yeah. Um, well, Rochelle, I'd like to hear from you too. I, I know you were at Amazon before yes. Salesforce. So you've probably seen two very different cultures. Yeah, and I, I attributed it to being a B2C versus B2B environment. Like at Amazon, it's B2C. Everything is very data-driven. Engineers are empowered to make product decisions. At uh, Salesforce, which is B2B, there is not a lot of data. It's, it's a sort of qualitative kind of data that is there, not quantitative. And so there, there is this asymmetry where PMs are the ones who have, you know, who are the voice of the customer and they're bringing in the requirements. And we are very conscious of that, uh, that, you know, engineers don't have the same information. Uh, and we take steps to bring them closer to the customer. Like one of the things we do is we make them part of the product uh, product decision process. So it's it's about them understanding what are the requirements and given these requirements, them then working with the PM to figure out what should be the features we build, what's feasible on our platform. So they're part of the entire process and not just seeing the end product of what a user designer would show them or what, oh, these are the screens you need to build. So we do that. The other thing we do is we bring the engineers in front of the customers. We ask them to talk at like customer conferences or partner conferences where they can interact with customers and have a better idea and appreciation for what for the customer needs, how they use the product, and have that empathy for the customer and for the role that the PM is playing uh, for them. Um, and so those are some of the things that we do that really helps, you know, helps engineers get a better understanding of what goes into the product decision making process. That, that's really interesting. So you're actually, you know, bringing engineers along to part of the journey that the PMs are kind of responsible for, right? Yeah. So gathering requirements. Yeah. Well, if you can get engineers in front of customers, they have a better empathy. Yeah. Is that like, I imagine there could be some disagreement about, it. is that a good yeah. use of, of their time? Is it something that they want to do? I mean, how have you... So it's, first of all, it's always a, um, a voluntary thing. Okay. They're not forced to do it. And the ones who are most interested in doing this, mostly the senior engineers are the ones who are usually interested because, you know, they are technically strong. They can build things on the platform. But now they're interested in knowing, okay, what else can we build? Can we extend our platform to the next level? And so for that, they, they are curious to know what is it that our customers want. So, yeah, it's completely voluntary, but we do see a lot of engineers very interested in trying to understand what, what our customers want. Yeah. So a, a kind of related question um, that's kind of raised is how does a company, so not the product and edge culture, but how does a company culture, right? Like whatever that is, um, affect how the dynamic between the teams. And like I, 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 what you were saying raised the example in my head. So I used to work at Tesla 
And that is a place that is a top-down culture, right? <laughs> that is a, Elon makes decisions and we all f do them. So that, I, you know, I think is created an environment where you certainly have engineers trying to just kind of cover their asses and PMs doing the same thing and you wind up with a adversarial kind of relationship. Um, not all of Tesla's that way, but that was certainly some of, some of the kind of effect of a top-down yeah. culture. Um, have you guys seen things similar to that? Like how a, I don't know, how Facebook's kind of culture of speed and, you know, and move fast and break things mantra or, or, or you know, how that has affected how these teams work together? I mean, it's a good question, but I think ultimately culture does, is always set from the top. So yeah. you're right that Tesla that happened from the top, the way Facebook was, it, it happened from the top. I right? think Zuck wanted engineers just to feel like they can do anything the way he did, and so that's kind of how the culture was perpetuated. And I've observed it changing even there because as a company grows and you have divisions um, and heads among those divisions, there's become more of a top-down culture because of that. Ultimately, it does start from the top. It just always does. So you're asking for examples. I think every company yeah. reflects its uh, its leaders. Can you change it? I mean, like, is, is there a, I mean, there's asking for a seat at a table, which is an awesome way to kind of bring yourself into the process. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to kind of change that culture from within? I don't know. It, this is like a, a big rhetorical question. It's very hard <laughs> to, to answer, but I don't know if you've seen anything that's relevant there. One thing I would say is like, at least at Salesforce, you know, it's a huge company, but we run as clouds, our business units, and every cloud has its own kind of culture, microculture. And you, so the culture that my team or my cloud has is way different from another team, and it depends on what state the product is at. So you can definitely influence that microculture and make things work for what would be beneficial for the stage you're at. Um, so yeah, to some extent, you can change the culture in the space that you're working in. Yeah, I think that I think especially as you're probably a bigger company, you really have independent units. You yeah. probably can have very different cultures within them. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just quickly talk about process. So you know, structure is a huge part of of kind of this relationship, um, how the teams are distributed. I, I think um, process is another one. So I think most of us are all using some form of agile. Um, that word is kind of not even that meaningful anymore. Right? It, we're all doing very iterative development. Um, so are the, what kind of or are there any unique things you do in that process um, that really bring these two teams together? So I, I'll start with you, Selena. Yeah, I guess this isn't quite a agile process in terms of like uh, certain meeting cadence, but I think one thing that I've seen work really well is building a really strong team identity um, for whatever product it is that you're building. And what I mean by that is um, having a really strong, whether it's mission statement, value prop, or a reason that's bringing everyone here, like whoever's working the product together. And so the objective and what it is that you're trying to achieve is very, very clear. I think when you have something really strong like that, um, it really helps bring people together. And I think there are like fun ways you can do to reinforce that idea. So um, at Facebook, what we used to do was each team would almost have, like you would have team swag, and so that was like kind of a sense of identity. We would have team mascots, and so different teams had kind of different animals. And so at your desk, you'd have, like if you're on one team, it might be unicorns, another one would be something else. And so you just had this sense of uh, connection that would, br that would bring you together, uh, regardless of if you, if you were in different, f I guess, functions, per se. I like that. So, so even kind of regardless of the agile process itself, but like that the team around it feels a sense of identity. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, so one of the things, I, and I referred to it before, is that when we do our monthly reviews, one of the things we do is we have the EMs and PMs stand together and give that presentation, and that sort of creates that sense of unity. But you know, beyond the agile process, I think there are some really basic things you can like, kind of like the swag, which is you know just celebrate the the milestones. You know, when you deliver product, you know, go out as a team and have your happy hour or go out for drinks. I think those are things that are really where the connections get made outside of work. Yeah. And those are really important, and it's important as a leader to encourage those to happen so that they really can work well together. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you know, this gets harder when you get bigger, but at least yeah. you know, at, at Triple Byte, trying to treat the product design and eng team as like one big team sometimes, right? Like bringing everybody out, not the whole company, but just the yeah. section of the company, um, I think is probably a good and effective thing to do. Right, I mean, this is the group that's going to have to work together. So I, um, we're running up on time. So I just um, one quick 
just one, right before this, <laughs> one quick question, um, just to kind of leave folks before we get to these questions, which is like, if you were to leave everyone here with one piece of advice or insight about how to align um, the, the product and engineering teams, what would, what would that be? We can start with you, you have the mic. Um, I guess I'll say embrace the tension. It's always there, it's there in every company in every relationship between EM and PM. And it's good to have tension. I think in some ways tension emphasizes the fact that the PMs are trying to do the best thing for the customers and EMs are trying to do the best thing for the product in terms of quality. And so that's okay. And just find that balance. I think for me, um, I start off by saying the source of the tension is because, you know, product and engineering are focusing on different things, external, internal, and um, have different knowledge. I think one thing I try to actually emphasize to my engineers is just empathy, that product, just understand that they're looking at different things. And so um, trust that they have, you know, trust that they have good intentions and just empathy goes a long way. You stole mine. Um, no, but I'll reiterate. I think empathy is, it is a really big one. I think a lot of it is um, when you get really caught up in what it is that you're trying to achieve, you kind of forget reasons that other people might be thinking of. And so I think really understanding where they're coming from, the perspective that they have is really, really important. I think each function, um, the reason why they're there is because they bring a different perspective and a different lens. And so you really want to embrace that, that um, diversity and that, and that difference. I think that's great. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the, these are questions submitted by folks here. Um, all right. <laughs> I like this first one. Should PMs worry about tech debt? Um, <laughs> well, who said no? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I like this guy. Okay. Um, do, do one of you guys want to answer first? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's going to catch up to you later on. <laughs> we, so LogDNA is a logging company, and we're really big on high reliability. And it's actually, uh, the tech does start to affect uh, product. Like, our customers are complaining sometimes. Uh, so um, it bites you in the end. So It, it even matters that, early? Sorry? <laughs> it even matters early? Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> unless you want, it, unless you want it to snowball. <laughs> um, OK. Um, what tools or products have you found most useful to facilitate the relationship? We have an internal tool, so I probably shouldn't speak about that. Well, what, what does it do? Uh, so yeah, uh, so we use, uh, we use so we, yes, we of course use Slack, but we also have Chatter which is like an internal collaboration sort of platform that we have where people, like every team has their own group and they can post updates on that. And it's just a very democratic way for people to post updates and have a conversation. And we just find that to be very effective at Salesforce. I mean, at Facebook, we use Facebook Workplace, which we're trying to do at Instacart too. But um, no, I think information dissemination is a really important one. So I think whatever tool it is, like for us, we use Workplace. It could be Slack. It could be something. But like somewhere where you're um, constantly keeping each other updated and posting information, I think the knowledge sharing becomes, if you can open a channel and, and make that fluid, then you just have a better understanding of what the other person's thinking, what's happening on both sides. Um, you can come, you can collaborate, collaborate. And so I think some sort of host for that is helpful. Um, well, my quick answer actually really isn't exactly a tool, but a thing that we do to foster the relationship. Um, so we, we have two week sprints and we have a naming convention for the sprints, which has become a source of, of comedy. And so the most, it, we, we just got through Samuel L. Jackson movies by alphabetical order. Nice. So we're, we're now on, we had a whole voting system to vote on the next topic. One of the PMs on the team's name is Alex. And so our topic or our, Sprints are named after things that Alex can break with his bare hands. And then for to start every sprint, he breaks it. So and it's alphabetical order. And so that like has become this like absolutely absurd, has no relevance to what we're doing, but like great way to get the whole team excited about something. Right? Even just like coming up with, with what E was, we're on E right now. It was eggs, raw eggs. So it's, it was it was messy. Um but yeah, that that was a great tool or or something to, to work on that. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes. Um, all right. What does a goal for an engineer that is product focused look? Oh, okay, there it is. Uh, look like. And on the flip side, what about a goal for a PM that is engineering focused? Well, 
I can speak to the first one because yeah. I think I m mentioned it. Um, in the past, it's just shipping the product, right? Like you are developing a new feature. Will a developer um, within this time frame at a high quality, whatever that measure of quality is defined? So it's pretty simple. Did you ship? Yeah. Um, I will leave the other one. I don't know. I think one example of this is scale. So when you're shipping a product, you know, it needs to meet a certain, you know, so many people can log in, so many people can access it at a time. Um, I think that is always sort of, it's a built-in engineering metric that's there even when the product is getting delivered, so, yeah. I actually think for product managers too, I think even performance can be a good yeah, metric, exactly. right? So, so just, is it, you know, is the site up, right? I mean, and that's, winds up that a lot of product decisions you make affect that. And, and so that should be a factor that, that PMs are thinking about. Um, all right, one or two more. Um, Let's see, how should PMs be measured? That's a really broad one. Um, probably depends on the company, the product, actually everything. Yeah, did you want to elaborate? Can I ask another question? Sure, let's get this one. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> I, I want to go to the, one of the first topics that was brought up. How do you define product management mm. What is the role of product management? Mm. Do, do people want to take it? Or? Do you want to start? Me? Well, like I said, it varies a lot, right? For some, it's the GM model. For some, it's the collaborative. It's, it's kind of up to, I guess, the leadership of the company to decide which model you're going to follow. Um, our VP of product has set the model at our company, so that's kind of what happens. And what is the model? It is a collaborative model. So he has the final... It's basically the idea is we want product and engineering to work together. So we are a team in terms of how we present ourselves and the decisions are made that way. Now, he, his role is to gather all the external requirements uh, and figure out kind of prioritization. And then um, engineering kind of figures out which ones we can do and what, and sort of scheduling and how implementation works. So it kind of breaks along those lines. Yeah. Well, well, one way I like to describe uh, role of product is you, you, you take the entire development process from like having no idea what you want to do to a shipped product that's successful in the market. And you basically say, you know, engineers are going to write code, designers are going to design kind of the visual experience. There's all sorts of other pieces that fill in, right? As you get bigger, you hire all these people to fill in. But the PM is kind of responsible for just making sure it gets from point A to point B, right? So it's kind of a, a filling in any of the gaps. And so the earlier stage company you are, the more gaps there are in your team. So they're going to fill in product marketer when you're really, you know, new. Or they're going to fill in, you know, even technical product managers may fill in kind of even doing some architecture stuff and, um, and so it just, it almost doesn't matter which exactly, what exactly the PM is doing on a given project, but that they're just kind of shepherding it from beginning to end. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's just making sure it happens, even if you're not the one who's doing it. Um, and so it's whether it's finding the right people in the room to figure out what it is, or if you're under-resourced, it's literally doing it yourself. Um, and so I think it's... It's hard. It's, I think it's it's hard to answer. It really depends on the resources that you do have, the strength of the team, and, and the nature of, of what it is you're trying to do. And Jedi mind tricks. That's obviously the other <laughs> part. That's core part of the job description. Um, all right, let's do one more. Um, I, I, I this is kind of a specific question, but I kind of enjoy the the ratio one. So what's what's the workable ratio of PMs to engineer? Um, and I, I have a quick thought on that, I'll start, which I, I think is, so the cop-out answer first, it depends, right? And, and I do think it actually depends on the type of product you have. So my two quick examples is that, you know, I used to work at Pebble smartwatch company, and that ratio was like one to 10, maybe more, right? And maybe one to, maybe one to 15. And because it's, it is a hardware product and everything you're doing is talking to, you know, the watch, talking to your mobile app, which is then talking to the web, which is then talking to our servers. And it's just like the technical complexity of a given feature is really high. And so you guys like, I write this, the specs and then 10 engineers are going to go work on it, right? Whereas at TripleByte, for example, where it's not technically as complex, at least the kind of, you know, maybe the machine learning part is, but the, but the rest of it is not. And so you wind up having like one to three or one to four can actually be pretty effective um, depending on how fast the engineers are. Yeah, I would say it's probably anywhere between five to 15 that I've seen, and it really depends on um, how many platforms you're, ship, you're building things on. So if it's the same feature and you're building on Android and then iOS and then web, then you have one engineer for each of those categories, but it's the same feature, so really the spec and, um, and the, the thinking behind it is, is the same. Whereas if everything was on web, then you know 10 web engineers means like 
versus yeah, it would just mean a lot more, a lot more products and a lot more things that you're shipping. So I would say anywhere between five to fifteen is probably more important to anchor on uh, number of things you're shipping rather than number of engineers you're working. Because like like um, what you're saying, if one thing is really really difficult, then the PM is pretty much done after like a month. Versus um, if you're, let's say, doing something that's growth and you're shipping like 20 different experiments or 20 different things in like a month or two, then you're a lot busier just doing the coordination, the handoffs, thinking of what to do, doing it like handing off designs, things like that. Any other thoughts? So at Salesforce, we do uh, by teams. So it's one PM for two teams. We've tried different ratios, and that's the one that we found most optimal. Because beyond two teams, we feel there's just too much context switching for the PM to the point that they stop being effective. Hmm. So, yeah. Interesting. Uh, it could be seven to eight engineers. So it comes to around 15 engineers, roughly. Cool. Well, on that note, um, I think we're, we're done. So thank you very much to the panelists. So. <laughs> and. Thank you to Plato for putting this on. <laughs>